In Colombia, nine soldiers were killed and eight wounded during an attack with explosives carried out by the National Liberation Army ELN to an army base on early Wednesday morning. The Brazilian Supreme Court hosted a public hearing to debate the principles, guarantees, rights and obligations for the use of the Internet in the country. Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian said he expects the final draft of a comprehensive strategic cooperation agreement with Moscow to be ready by next month. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Teleso Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Colombia on Wednesday, nine soldiers were killed and eight wounded during an attack with explosives carried out by the National Liberation Army to an army base at 3 a.m. local time. The attack base is located in Catatumbo, a rural area of the municipality of El Carmen, Department of North of Santander. The victims were two non-commissioned officers and seven young soldiers involved in the military service. Colombian President Gustavo Petro condemned the attack through his Twitter account, saying the ELN is turning its back to the peace process and the Colombian people. Petro announced that he has called the ELN delegation to the dialogue table along with the accompanying countries because, in his words, the peace process must be serious and responsible with the Colombian society. In this context, Colombian Defense Minister Ivan Velasquez also rejected the attack and confirmed that President Gustavo Petro had summoned the ELN to the peace negotiating table to examine the attack. The president has just summoned the delegation and the negotiating table with the National Liberation Army. He has called them to examine this attack, which is a very serious incident, which we deeply regret and we express solidarity with the relative of the two non-commissioned officers and with the seven soldiers killed. We also want to express solidarity with the army. On Tuesday, some 2,000 indigenous people of Ecuador rallied to ask the Constitutional Court to give the green light to the impeachment trial against President Guillermo Lasso. The highest court has in its hands the last word on whether or not to give way to the trial proposed by a sector of the legislative, where the opposition is a majority but dispersed. The indigenous people advanced to the seat of the court before going to the National Assembly, where they presented a bill for the management of water sources. This is the second attempt by the legislative to remove Lasso from office. In June, in the midst of the indigenous protests due to the high cost of living, opposition legislators presented a motion to dismiss the president for serious social commotion but did not gather the necessary votes. This time, Lasso faces an alleged corruption case in which his brother-in-law and a former government official are involved. This government is no longer legitimate, therefore it must listen to the people. We believe it is important that the constitutional court, if it does not want a reaction from the people, guarantees through constitutional democratic means the impeachment trial of the government of President Guillermo Lasso. We are here to demand that the Constitutional Court of Ecuador approve the impeachment trial because in the whole Amazon there is violence, crime, assassinations. The Brazilian Supreme Court hosted a public hearing to debate the rules of the civil framework of the Internet, which establishes the principles, guarantees, rights and obligations for the use of the Internet in the country. To the two-day hearing had some notable participants such as Google, Facebook, Twitter and ByteDance Brazil. Among others, in this type of meetings, the public is invited to offer its view on the interpretation of a law. The Marco Civil in particular came at a time where the debate on internet regulation is at the forefront of public policy discussions, not only in Brazil but in the entire world. Therefore, the decisions of the cases debated in the hearings have the effective potential to shape how the South American giant will tackle this thorny issue. On Tuesday, Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez met with United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres to resume negotiations on the sovereignty of the Malvina Islands. Fernandez is striving for a speedy, peaceful resolution to the sovereignty issue on the islands. He also discussed climate change, which Fernandez said translates for Argentina in the worst drought experience over the last 70 years, affecting 173 million hectares. Moreover, the leaders addressed the need to restructure international funding mechanisms favoring transparency and accessibility to allow indebted countries to recover solvency and have access to international financial markets. 
President Fernandez is in the United States to meet his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden for a bilateral summit for which both sides will be accompanied by at least eight of their ministers. The Mexican government has announced the arrest of several officials following a fire at a migrant center which killed 39 asylum seekers. Mexican Foreign Secretary Marcelo Ebrard said that those directly responsible for the incident at the facilities of the National Institute of Migration in Ciudad Juarez have already been indicted by the Attorney General's office. Ebrard said the governments of the countries of origin of the deceased migrants have been notified of the tragic incident and that Mexico has instructed its consulates in those countries to provide support and assistance to the victims' relatives. Ebrard said that what happened is a terrible tragedy and he conveyed Mexico's deep indignation for the incident as well as the government's will to clarify the facts so as to punish those responsible. A barge loaded with 1,400 tons of methanol capsized on Tuesday in the Ohio River at Louisville, Kentucky, after a group of cargo vessels broke free from the tugboat carrying them. The state agency's emergency response team said work is underway to round up several of the 10 barges navigating the Ohio River. The threat of leakage of the toxic substance forced authorities to deploy a team of hazardous materials experts to ensure that the locks are closed until navigation is restored. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention stated that methanol is a toxic alcohol that is used industrially as a solvent, pesticide, and alternative fuel source. However, the Louisville Water Company, which manages the water resources in the area, issued a statement assuring the population that the accident did not endanger the community's drinking water sources. This is another incident in a series of such events, as on February 3rd, a train carrying pollutants derailed near the city of East Palestine, Ohio, causing serious damage to the environment and the death of numerous animal species. Let's take a short break, but first remember you can follow us on TikTok at the account at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. On Tuesday, Kazakhstan's government resigned after the election of a new lower house. According to the Kazakh constitution, the government must step down when this chamber of parliament is elected. In the meantime, the cabinet of ministers will exercise its functions until the new executive is approved. According to the legislation, the president of the country, after a consultation with the parliamentary groups, must nominate the prime minister and subsequently appoint him to the post under parliamentary approval. Kazakhstan held parliamentary elections on March 19th, and the ruling Amanat party won 62 of the 98 seats. President Kasim Jomar Tokayev pointed out that the early vote was part of a modernization drive introduced after the country witnessed an attempted coup in January last year. Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Bodolahayan said on Wednesday that he expects the final draft of a comprehensive strategic cooperation agreement with Moscow to be ready by next month. At a meeting with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in Moscow, the Iranian minister said he expects the legal departments of their respective foreign ministries to have the text ready by April. The Iranian minister said that to that end, High-level delegations of both countries have been holding regular meetings and that the presidents have been in direct communication throughout the whole process. This has also resulted in a bilateral coordinated stance at international forum. During the meeting with his Iranian counterpart, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov called for the rapid resumption of the Iran nuclear deal and added that the world is still waiting for the United States to fulfill its obligations in this regard. We have a mutual understanding that there is no alternative to this international agreement, which was adopted in unanimity by the UN Security Council. We are in favor of the swift resumption of the full implementation of this resolution and oppose actions that hinder it. The war is still waiting for the United States to return to its obligation under the nuclear deal. We specifically stress that all illegal sanctions against Iran must be lifted. The head of the UN Atomic Energy Watchdog returned on Wednesday to the Saporizhia nuclear power plant. 
Rafael Mariano Grossi, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, visited the nuclear power plant facilities and was recorded at his tour on Russian state TV, where he expressed his gratitude for having facilitated the presence of UN working members at the site. The UN watchdog has had a permanent rotating team at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant since September. Grossi declared on Tuesday that he sees it as his duty to intensify talks between Kiev and Moscow to safeguard the facility and avoid a catastrophic accident as he anticipated an agreement was close. However, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky then stated he was less optimistic that deal was near. I think it's important that we uh, can continue uh, our dialogue. Um, I want to thank you uh, for having facilitated the presence of our teams here uh, since September. On Wednesday, a big fire at a solvents factory on the outskirts of the north Italian city of Novara raised the alarms about the possible spread of toxic fumes. The explosion occurred at the premises of Chemi Company, a factory that produces paints, industrial dyes and solvents. After the event, the Novara mayor, Alessandro Canelli, appealed to residents to stay indoors and children to remain in their classrooms at schools, with windows closed as the entire area is cordoned off. Meanwhile, the Regional Environmental Protection Agency began to run tests on the air quality in the area, as a large black cloud of smoke has spread over it. So far, authorities have not confirmed any fatalities as a result of the explosion. The office of the Prime Minister of France, Elizabeth Bourne, sent on Tuesday an invitation to the main trade unions to hold a meeting and resume the dialogue in the face of massive protests in that country due to the pension reform. The invitation was confirmed in an interview granted to a local TV station by the leader of the French Democratic Confederation of Labour, Laurent Berger. The trade unionists declared that they will go to the meeting with their proposals on labour issues, among them to suspend the reform or at least his most controversial aspects, such as raising the retirement age to 64 by 2030. The meeting is expected to take place between Monday, April the 3rd and Wednesday, April 5th, before the 11th day of mobilizations against the government measure called for next April 6th. The European Court of Human Rights on Wednesday heard cases against France and Switzerland for possible failures to protect the environment and alleged in action on climate change. The case against Switzerland is based on a complaint by an association of elderly people who call themselves the Club of Climate Seniors, concerned with the consequences of global warming on their living conditions and health. The lawsuit against France was brought by Damien Carem, former mayor of Grand Synth, a suburb of Dunkirk in northern France, who also argues that the central government has breached its obligations to protect life by failing to take sufficient measures to prevent climate change. Teresa English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries through Starsat, dial 461 and enjoy Latin American alternative broadcasts. One final short break and we'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back from the South. On Thursday, Chinese authorities said they strongly opposed the transit stopover planned by Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen in the U.S. on her return from her trip to Central America. The Chinese government claimed that they will not tolerate any form of future contact between the U.S. and Taiwan that violates the One China principle and that they will take resolute countermeasures in such a case. Reports state that Taiwan's president plans to meet with U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in California after she returns from Guatemala and Belize at the end of her trip. On the other hand, Su Fan Glan, spokesman for the Taiwan Affairs Office of the China State Council, said the stopover by Taiwanese authorities in the country is a provocative act that undermines the sovereignty and territorial integrity of China, as well as peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. China's foreign ministry spokesperson, 
Mao Ning stressed China sees the visit of the Taiwanese president to the U.S. as a clear violation of the One China principle and a provocation by Washington. The mistakes of the past do not excuse the mistakes of today, and the addition of the number of mistakes does not provide any legitimacy. The transit to the U.S. is a fake reason conjured up by Taiwan leader. The true reason is to seek breakthroughs and promote her Taiwan independence agenda. It is not China that overreacts, but the U.S. side that blindly connives with and support Taiwan independence and secessionist forces. China is firmly opposed to any form of official exchanges between the U.S. and Taiwan, firmly opposed to the visit of the Taiwan leader to the U.S. under any name and for any reason, and firmly opposed to any form of contact between the U.S. and the Taiwanese authorities, in violation of the One China principle. China has lodged solemn representations with the U.S. side many times over Tsai Win wens transit to the U.S. On further, Israeli occupation army soldiers continue to deploy in the West Bank village of Huwara, a Palestinian town located in Nablus. Residents of the Palestinian village of Huwara denounced security restrictions imposed by the occupation army blocking part of their main street and made heightened tensions between Palestinians and foreign military presence. On Wednesday, at least six Palestinians were injured after being attacked by Israeli settlers in the Palestinian town of Huwara, south of Nablus, in the, west, in the occupied West Bank. On February, the town was the scene of a settler attack that killed one Palestinian and injured hundreds before Israeli finance minister Bessalev Smotrich denied the existence of a Palestinian people or nationhood. The Israeli army closed or intersection leading to the main street and also closed the Huwara checkpoint, which is located north of the town and some checkpoints leading to the city of neighbors in order to immobilize people in Huwara and it indeed succeeded as the main street is also empty and only settlers and the occupation's military vehicles pass through it. There is no sense of security. Everyone stays awake, afraid for our children because there is no security. Yesterday the settlers broke Palestinian properties under the protection of the Israeli army and if you wanted to defend yourself, the soldiers would shoot you with life ammunition and fire tear gas. The army protects the settlers, otherwise settlers are nothing without the army protection. African leaders gathered to review the protocol relating to the free movement of people, right of residents and right of establishment. The protocol adopted in 2018 aimed at demonstrating the imperative of the free movement of people for continental integration, particularly for the effective implementation of the African continental free trade area. However, the protocol has only been ratified by four countries, Rwanda, Niger, Sao Tome and Principe, and Mali, and Mali far below the 15 ratification threshold required for it to come into force. In this sense, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and the African Union Commission launched a study to intensify and demonstrate the benefits of the free movement of people to establish the factors that account for the slow ratification of the AU's free movement of persons protocol and to make policy recommendations on how to accelerate the ratification of the protocol. We have come to the end of this news brief from you can find these and many other stories on our website telesoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telesor English, I'm Mr. Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.